All right, everybody's here. Hello, everybody. As y'all know, we have our special guest lecturer today, the Congresswoman. And uh, just a quick housekeeping stuff. After we finish the uh, guest lecture, we will have a question and answer period on the back end. Okay, and so that's where you'll be able to ask your questions. I will be giving you quiz questions from what she presents today. So, you know, broad things, make sure you're taking notes and everything like that. Um, and then, you know, afterwards we'll continue with the lecture. Okay, so without further ado, allow me to introduce uh, Nanette Diaz Bergan, right? She's my Congresswoman. She was born in Harbor City, California. Her parents, they immigrated from Mexico and she was the youngest of 11 children. Right? She earned a BA in political science from UCLA in 2000 and went on to earn her JD from USC in 2005, right? She got this work, that's where she got her law degree. In 2013, Berrigan won a seat on the Hermosa Beach City Council. She became the first Latina in the history of Hermosa Beach to be elected to the city council and went on to serve as mayor. And during her two year term on the city council, Nanette successfully stood up to a powerful oil company and stopped a proposal to drill 34 oil and water injection wells in Hermosa Beach and out into the Santa Monica Bay. Right. Nanette Diaz Berrigan was first elected to represent California's 44th district in the US House of Representatives in 2016. That's my district. And Berrigan serves on both the Homeland Security Committee and the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, Congresswoman Berrigan is the second vice chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and the co-chair of the United for Climate and Environmental Justice Task Force, which provides a voice and platform for members of Congress prioritizing issues affecting environmental justice communities. So we are so grateful to have Congresswoman Annette diaz Berrigan as a guest lecturer today. And we're gonna be talking about environmental justice. And so Congresswoman, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you and good afternoon to everybody joining us virtually. It's great to be with you today. Uh, thank you, Professor Robertson for inviting me to take part in your class and provide some background on environmental justice, how it originated, the challenges, that we face today and solutions available to us. So we're gonna start with our first slide, uh, which is a map of California's 44th Congressional District. It's our second slide. And this is um, a slide that shows you where my district is. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Port of Los Angeles in San Pedro, that's where the district starts and it goes straight up the 110 north. It's in between the 110, the 710, and a little north of the 105 freeway. It includes areas like San Pedro, Wilmington, Carson, Compton, Watts, Linwood, Southgate, North, Long Beach, uh, Willowbrook. And so if you know somebody that lives in that district, that's my congressional district and the professors as well. So over 70% of constituents that live in California's 44th district are Latino and about 90% are combined Latino African American. So it's greatly diverse, people of color, very working class district. There's only four districts poorer in the entire state of California than California's 44th district. Now, if you live anywhere near, near Malibu or in Malibu, uh, that's actually in uh, the second richest district in the country. So just to give you some perspective of the differences um, across the board here in Los Angeles. And so the district is surrounded by freeways, um, industry, the port, and that leads to poor air quality and public health for us. And so let's turn to the question, what is environmental justice and what's an environmental justice issue? So our next slide is, poses that very question and environmental laws and regulations uh, protect us from pollution and decisions affecting the environment that can impact our quality of life. Now, if you take a look at the slide, it'll tell us environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, 
and policies. And so um, this is what we call, uh, you know, the textbook definition. But the bottom line is that environmental justice is when all people get equal protection from environmental harm and equal access to the decision making process that impacts um, the environment. So no matter your race, your color, your national origin or your income, you and your community should have equal protection uh, from environmental impacts and equal access to the decision making process. So unfortunately, this is not always the case. So the environmental justice movement is the effort to keep pollution from disproportionately affecting communities of color and low income communities as it does now. This is called environmental injustice. So the injustice is when it's disproportionate. It is when you can go to Malibu and have an environmental issue resolved quickly. Um, residents come out and there's quick attention let's say there's brown water coming out of the faucets. Now move that to Compton, California, or in a, a working class area, it's not addressed and we're seeing environmental injustices. But let's tell you about some environmental injustices that you may have heard of. And let's start right here in our very backyard in Los Angeles is our next slide. We can look right here at home in Southern California where millions of residents lived, sandwiched between multiple highways and heavy truck traffic bringing goods to and from the ports. Uh, public health experts call these areas diesel death zones because we have more air pollution related deaths than anywhere in the country. So I often say we're in a diesel death zone or we have some of the worst air pollution. That's because of industry, that's because of the pollution from the traffics. And who lives in these communities? Diverse communities, low income communities, working class communities. Um, and so uh, that's, that's one that we can just see right here um, in our backyard. Now, as I said at the beginning, my district is facing not only the pollution from the truck traffic and highways, but we're living right next to the port of LA and Long Beach. We're also living around urban oil drilling near homes and schools, oil refineries and heavy industry, including liquefied petroleum gas storage. So in some parts of the district, the air can be uncomfortable to breathe or smell. And I frequently see young kids walk around with inhalers around their necks it's, um, in the parks uh, because of the high asthma rate here. Now this is a public health crisis as much as an environmental um, crisis. And so um, our next slide, uh, six is the protest in Flint, Michigan. Oh, this was the, the last slide. We just went over some of these environmental injustice in the California's 44th district. Um, if we could get to this next slide, um, I'm sure many of you heard about Flint, Michigan and protests happening in Flint, Michigan. That's what this slide here is about, where you had a situation, they tried to cut cost. So they had a cut cost saving measure where the state government forced the city to switch its water supply to the heavily polluted Flint River, which corroded the pipes and caused high levels of lead in the water. Now, despite repeated claims by Flint residents that the water was making people sick, the state and even the EPA, they failed to take the concern seriously. And we know that resulted in people getting ill, our children getting ill. If you think about this for a moment, Flint's population is a majority African-American and about 45% of its residents live below the poverty line. This environmental injustice would not be allowed to happen in wealthy non-diverse communities. Um, although many of the lead pipes have been replaced since the crisis began, residents are afraid to drink the water um, and they still purchase bottled water. And so the Flint crisis is another example of an environmental injustice. One more so you can uh, get an idea, slide seven. Um, you'll see here the residents in St. James, St. John's, the Baptist Parish in Louisiana protesting a horrific 85 mile stretch of the Mississippi River lined with oil refineries and petrochemical plants. This area is known as Cancer Alley because of the concentration of toxic and petrochemical facilities located in the community that are causing higher rates of cancer. And so just so you have an understanding is,
sometimes these companies, the polluters will pick communities that maybe they're working two jobs, maybe they're uh, below the poverty rate, they're less likely to make a ruckus. Um, and that is really targeting and that's why we're seeing some of these environmental injustices. Now these pollution issues we're seeing in black and brown and indigenous communities today were major problems throughout the country's half a century ago. So in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, and we can move on to the next slide, um, in the late 1960s and the late 1970s, there was a huge surge in environmental awareness and advocacy around the country because of several high profile pollution problems, including oil spills, uh, pollution of the Great Lakes, and concern over the impact of pesticides and other chemicals. Now this led to modern day environmental movement and lots of public pressure on Congress, uh, which led to the passage of several landmark environmental laws to clean up our air and our water. So uh, there was a movement, uh, we saw incidences occur that puts pressure on Congress to say, Congress, you better do something about this. We passed several landmark environmental laws that were designed to clean the air and the water and to protect wildlife from extinction. So this here is a slide of the front page of the New York Times on the first Earth Day in 1970. And as you can see there, it lists some of these landmark environmental laws like the Clean Air Act, the National Environmental Protect Policy Act, the creation of the US uh, EPA, uh, the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. Um, and so that was the result of what Congress did. So unfortunately, um, these laws sometimes have outcomes that uh, don't provide equal protections and they don't protect everybody. So the fight for environmental justice has focused on how Black, Latino, Indigenous, and poor communities have been left behind despite the passing of so many environmental laws in the 1970s. Now these laws have shortcomings that fail to protect vulnerable communities from high concentrations of industrial pollution and overdevelopment. And unfortunately, the outcome of this has been that more affluent uh, white communities blocking incinerators, landfills, oil wells, and power plants, and the companies have figured out that it's easy just to go build these in communities of color, uh, poorer communities that have fewer resources to fight back. Uh, access to elected officials and the p political process also um, provides, you know, it's really favored toward uh, more wealthy communities, um, non-diverse communities uh, because of access, uh, maybe involvement. Now the representation of decision-making and regulatory bodies has historically been white. It's been also male. Um, this is starting to change with recent elections. However, the CEOs of companies that cause environmental damage are still heavily white and male. And this is one of the reasons I tell people all the time um, that we need to have more people in government that look like us, more people in government who share our values, who understand our communities, who understand what it's like to live in these uh, polluted areas because we have a seat at the table and we're then able to um, provide our feedback and see where we need to shore up areas uh, and communities that are still not fully covered and there's that disparate of impact. So there are several examples in the 1960s of black and brown communities fighting for environmental protections. Uh, let's see, Latino farm workers in the 1960s, led by Cesar Chavez, fought for workplace rights, including protections from harmful pesticides in the farm fields. Uh, in 1968, residents of West Harlem fought unsuccessfully against a sewage treatment plant in their community. However, the birth of the environmental justice movement is considered to be in poor, rural, and heavily black Warren County, North Carolina in 1982. The state government decided to put a hazardous waste landfill in the county, which would be filled by more than 6,000 trucks carrying soil laced with toxic PCBs, chemicals, that's chemicals that can cause cancer. So residents were concerned that the chemicals could get into the groundwater and the dump trucks uh, 
first rolled into Warren County in mid-September 1982, headed for the newly constructed landfill in the small community of Afton. But many frustrated residents and their allies upset that state officials had dismissed concerns over PCBs, stopped the trucks lying down on the roads leading into the landfill. And that's what you see here in this slide. People putting their bodies on the line, people standing up and saying, not here in my community. So six weeks of marches and nonviolent street protests followed and more than 500 people were arrested. The first arrest in US history over the sitting um, of a landfill. So people in Warren County ultimately lost the fight, um, but they put that fight up. The toxic waste was eventually deposited. Let's see here. I wanna make sure I didn't lose you because I lost my screen. Um, there we go. Um, and so the toxic waste was eventually deposited in that landfill, but their story drew national media attention and inspire, inspired people across the country who had lived through similar injustice. So this time, the racism that we're seeing wasn't over housing or education, um, it was environmental racism. The protest energized a new faction within the civil rights movement, and it became the fight for environmental justice. And something that we still hear about today, when you hear about environmental injustice, we're talking about things like this. When you hear about systematic racism across the country and how it's still happening on an environmental justice angle, that's what we're talking about is this pollution um, that is really impacting our communities of color. So if we go to our next slide, it took over a decade to make progress at the federal level. A landmark executive order signed by President Clinton in 1994 was the first major federal action on environmental justice, or what we call the EJ movement in the United States. Now, it required that all federal agencies make achieving environmental justice part of its mission by identifying and addressing as appropriate, disproportionately high and adverse health, human health or environmental effects of its programs, policies and activities on minority populations and low income uh, populations. Uh, the executive order referenced uh, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, which prohibits recipients of federal financial assistance, such as state and local governments from discriminating based on race, color, or national origin in any program or activity. Now, a Title VI uh, civil rights complaint may raise environmental justice issues when challenging a recipient's activity. So, for example, if a state agency receives funds from the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency to run a clean air program under Title VI, that state recipient is legally prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race, color, or national origin when engaging in clean air enforcement activities. So the issuance of the order brought legitimacy and attention to the environmental justice movement and its underlying principle that low income communities of color bear a disproportionate burden of environmental pollution and its health effects, right? And so this was really the moment where it was more of a recognition that something was um, being done with this executive order. Now, unfortunately, the executive order lacked the requirements that environmental justice play a determining factor in sitting, rulemaking, and permitting decisions. So in too many cases, it's been a box to check off on a list of requirements for agencies merely to consider. And that hasn't really been enough. So polluting industries have continued to overwhelmingly locate in communities of color, finding them to be the path of least resistance. In some cases, the leaders in environmental justice uh, communities accept polluting industry because they're desperate for the jobs and the economic growth that's promised because of the historic lack of investment they've experienced. So this is how we have cities and counties where some neighborhoods have clean air, 
and clean water while others literally can't breathe. And so let's talk a little bit about solutions. Uh, slide 13 is the movement for environmental and climate justice is fighting to change this. My colleagues and I in Congress are working to evaluate some of the solutions and that we need in order to ensure everyone has clean air, clean water, and a safe uh, climate. So at risk of oversimplifying, here is a brief overview of four pillars of how we can make progress where we haven't seen before. A green stimulus, a stronger regulations, and those are environmental regulations, a just transition from fossil fuels and better monitoring and enforcement. And those are monitoring enforcement of environmental rules and regulations. Now we have seen under this administration, a rollback of those uh, regulations. And so uh, we need to go in the other direction. We've gone backwards. And so this is something that um, you hear people talk about is at stake in November. and every administration has their focus. So let's first talk about um, a green stimulus. Uh, we need a green stimulus investment to create millions of jobs and take on the climate crisis. A majority of these funds need to be targeted to addressing pollution in environmental justice communities, where it's clean energy, clean vehicles, or environmental restoration and cleanup. There's no shortage, shortage of needs that we have, they can't be addressed without funding. So we've got to put our money where our mouth is. Um, we've got to invest and we've got to do it boldly um, to be able to create these jobs. Second, uh, we need to undo the dozens of Trump administration rules that have weakened our environmental protections. And that's our next slide. So we need to, we need to undo the rules um, that uh, this administration has effectively weakened the environmental protections, and then go further by strengthening our pollution standards and adopting new regulations that either ban or restrict the use of toxic chemicals and pollutants that harm community health. So all of these decisions should be made with priority consideration given to environmental justice communities. In other words, we need to think about who it's impacting, who it's affecting, and making sure we're not just adding more pollution and injustice into those uh, communities that are already bearing the brunt and on the front line, as we like to say, in the EJ uh, community. Third, uh, we need to transition off fossil fuels. Um, this shouldn't be controversial since we know they're responsible for much of our pollution and the climate crisis, and it's really the future. We've seen it in California, we're moving to, to going green, um, but we need to stop building uh, new fossil fuel infrastructure and then uh, reduce our, and also reduce our independence. So part of the green stimulus I talked about has to include economic relief for workers in the fossil fuel industry. Those who are in those industries, many of them live in environmental justice communities where polluting facilities are located. This includes um, also putting a focus on funding pensions, lost wages, and job training so they can move into the clean energy industry. I hear all the time, I work in the industry, I need a job. Well, you know what, when we come up with these plans and these investments, we need to keep them in mind to making sure they have the new job skills and what they need to transition to the clean energy jobs. And finally, um, we need to have data at the neighborhood level on where pollution is at unsafe levels. We need to identify the industries violating our clean air and water laws and require them to get in compliance. So one policy change absolutely critical to making this work is that when the government is considering whether to approve a permit for a facility or infrastructure in a community, it cannot just look at the impact of that single project, but of how many polluting industries are already there, right? Communities of color must no longer be dumping grounds for polluting industries. And in closing, a critical part of environmental justice is equal involvement by all people in the decisions that impact their lives. So this includes the movements that fight for clean air, clean water, and a sustainable planet. To achieve environmental and climate justice, 
the environmental movement needs to better reflect the diverse community facing the greatest threat of harm from pollution. Protest, rallies, and grassroots organizing created the modern day environmental movement and the current environmental justice movement. So in the process that has been made, in, in the progress that's been made rather, the people have led the way. It's been about the grassroots, followed by a policy change from elected officials. And in many ways, the movement we see today fighting against systematic racism and for equality echo back to the struggle for justice and equality that began when the civil rights uh, movement happened in the 1950s and the 1960s. And despite the enormous obstacles people faced, they were able to pressure the government to respond to their demands. Now, whether we can deliver the change people are demanding now, including for environmental justice, comes down to the health of our democracy and its ability to give all people a voice in determining our future to make it happen. We all have to be at the table. And so that's why I'm a big supporter and fan on making sure that we have everybody included. And so uh, Professor Robertson, those are the end of my remarks um, and, and my lecture on environmental justice. I thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward for, uh, for questions from your students. I know there was a lot to take there on environmental justice, um, but just think about it as a fight for equality and a fight so that we all have access to clean air and water. So looking forward to this uh, interaction with your students. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, you know, when, for the students, if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand uh, in the bar and then I'll go ahead and spotlight you and, and call on you. Um, but just to start off while they're deciding their questions, I had a question, which is, you know, this week is happens to be civil rights, right? We're talking about civil rights this week. And so, you know, we, they, they just learned that everyone is supposed to have equal protection under the law. And so do you feel like uh, these examples of environmental injustices are examples of folks not having uh, equal protections under the law? Absolutely. And part of it is the failure in our current laws to protect people equally. And that's what the movement's about. And the movement continues today because it's still happening today, right? If you think about for a moment about what happened in Flint, Michigan, where the water was coming out with lead, can you just imagine for a moment that happening in Malibu, California? If residents in Malibu, California, where Pepperdine is located, knew that the water was having lead and it was hurting the development of the children's brains, you know there would be mass protests, they would be showing up at City Hall, and there would probably be really quick action. But what happened in Flint was they didn't take them seriously. The communities of color, the low income, maybe they're working two jobs, maybe they can't get the crowds out. And that is an injustice. And so we need to make sure that not only are we taking um, these complaints seriously, but looking past, well, who is it? And I'm gonna tell you just a quick story because this is really shocking to me. Uh, and it happened, it was a true story. Um, several years ago, as a member of Congress, there was water coming out of the faucets in Compton, California, and it was coming out brown. And I remember going to somebody um, in the city and saying, this is unacceptable. Brown water is coming out of the faucets. And the response I got was, well, Congresswoman, why are you making a big deal about this? It's only 400 people. Well, it's only 400 households. And I said to myself, this is an injustice. This is the wrong mentality, because in Malibu, it wouldn't take 400, 400 households, 400 people impacted with brown water would have gone through the roof. And so the, the, the attitude, the lack of concern for residents and their health was very different there than what I would have gotten had I spoken to somebody in Malibu at the council or in city government. Absolutely. Thank you for answering that. Let me see, I'm gonna to go to uh, 